our visitors could not come uh, at a more interesting time in uh, U.S.-Japan alliance relations and developments in Asia. Um, what we'll do for the next two hours is um, start with uh, Professor uh, Shinichi Kitaoka, um, with whom I'll have a dialogue, and then we'll open it up to the audience for questions to talk about um, the Abe administration's security agenda, how it fits um, in uh, the history and development of Japanese strategic thinking um, and the significance for our alliance. And then we'll move right at 4 o'clock into a panel discussion, uh, which will be moderated by uh, Tsuyoshi Sunohara, uh, friend to many people in this room, who is the Secretary General for the U.S. Japan Project um, at uh, Nikkei Shimbun. And that panel will include uh, General Noboru Yamaguchi, Admiral uh, Yoji Koda, uh, Robin Sachs-Sakota, and Sheila Smith. Um, then we'll adjourn promptly at 5. So let me begin by introducing uh, Professor Kitaoka and, and, uh, and opening our first uh, discussion. Um, uh, Shinichi Kitaoka is the president of the International University of Japan, IUJ, George Packard's uh, former home, um, and a professor of modern Japanese politics and diplomacy at um, GRIPS, the National Institute, uh, Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, executive director of research at, RIP, at IPS, the International Institute of Policy Studies, and an emeritus professor at Todai. Um, there is barely an influential advisory commission on foreign policy or defense in the past two decades that he has not either led or been a member of. Most recently, the advisory panel on national security and defense capabilities, which shaped the um, strategic uh, framework for uh, Japan's defense documents uh, uh, this last year. <coughs> and his most recent job, uh, as chair, uh, acting chair of the advisory panel um, on reconstruction of the legal basis for national security, which focused on a number of issues, but uh, most prominently um, how to uh, determine uh, and, and, uh, and uh, guide Japan's uh, right of uh, collective self-defense. And so Kitoka Sensei um, is a historian and a foreign policy practitioner. He's been an ambassador to the United Nations. Um, and I wanted to open up by asking, uh, welcoming you uh, first uh, and uh, saying what a great honor and pleasure it is to have you all here today. But let me ask first if you could give an overview for the audience of the key elements of Prime Minister Abe's security strategy um, and, uh, and, and how they fit uh, for Japan historically and what they mean to the U.S. And then we'll dive into some of the specifics. Thank you very much, Mike, uh, uh, for inviting us. And then uh, this is my first visit to this new building, uh, and then I'm very happy to be here. Uh, uh, since the establishment of uh, Abe, second Abe administration in December uh, uh, 2012, uh, there has been remarkable changes in, uh, develop in the uh, security policies. First of all, uh, he established or re-established the advisory panel on restructuring the legal basis for national security, and then uh, he also established an uh, advisory panel on national security and defense capability uh, in uh, September last year. And then uh, based on the uh, uh, discussion in the uh, LADATA, advisory panel on national security and defense uh, capability, uh, uh, Japanese government adopted the national defense guideline for 2014 and beyond. And then also at the same time, uh, again, the based on the discussion in this panel, uh, national security strategy was adopted for the first time. Because Japan was uh, notorious for its uh, 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 sectionalism. Uh, it's uh, very hard to uh, integrate the policies uh, across the uh, foreign policy, defense policy, and so forth. So uh, the, this is very important to establish a, a leading, uh, to adopt a leading concept, which is uh, characterized uh, one, by more international cooperation, and second, a more active contribution to peace. And then uh, the uh, national defense guideline was, uh, which is usually uh, adopted every several years, uh, in which the key concept was uh, uh, the uh, joint and dynamic defense forces. Uh, and then uh, along with these developments, uh, the Abe cabinet established the National Security Council, which was also very necessary to uh, overcome the sectionalism. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, Secret Information Protection Act 
was enacted in December. Uh, these are all uh, uh, the homeworks for the uh, realists uh, for years, and then uh, these kind of things were uh, uh, achieved, which was remarkable. Uh, but uh, as a whole, uh, if everything was uh, uh, achieved, still the Japan will remain as a very normal, uh, moderate, peace-loving country. I'm very sure about that. Uh, and then the final homework is uh, the, this, uh, the agenda for the advisory panel on uh, legal restructuring. So the, uh, we are now, we have just uh, presented our report to the Prime Minister in May 15. And then uh, the focus of the uh, media is now uh, uh, directed to the negotiation between LDP and Kometo. Um, let me ask you, putting on your historian's hat, um, how new is all this? Um, in some ways, a lot of this was Prime Minister Noda's agenda. Um, and arguably, since John Foster Dulles, the U.S. at various points has asked for Japan to exercise the right of collective self-defense, for example, or asked for greater flexibility in arms export rules to enhance defense industrial cooperation. So is, is what abe is doing, it's in the media, it's new or scary or dramatic, but from your perspective, how new is all this? Or is this a natural evolution? Well, uh, actually, uh, the, uh, many uh, fo uh, foreign policy and defense policy experts have been arguing about this since 1990s. Uh, you know, 1990s, a year in, uh, in which uh, the uh, Saddam Hussein invaded into Kuwait, and then uh, uh, there was a heated discussion in Japan, what Japan could do over there. And then, then we found that the interpretation of the Cabinet Legislation Bureau, that uh, the exercise of collective right of defense is prohibited under our constitution. This, is, uh, this ha has become an obstacle uh, for Japan to go beyond. Uh, because of this, we are unable to join in, in any uh, part of the uh, uh, multinational forces in uh, 1990s. So since then, uh, the experts have been discussing this very much, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, solution of this uh, issue is, uh, uh, was made possible by two things, or three things. One is, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the deteriorating uh, security environment around Japan, which uh, made uh, people aware of the importance of this issue. And secondly, uh, the opposition party, DPJ government has experienced uh, its, uh, 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 they, they just had in power, were in power for three years and then they experienced the, the necessity, they came to understand the necessity of this policy. Uh, not all of them, but uh, some of them. And then thirdly, um, of course, Prime Minister Abe's leadership. And then that's why uh, we, are, uh, we come to, uh, come to uh, uh, almost close this issue. It, uh, reading your report, which came out um, a month ago, um, and listening to the deliberations in the Diet, it seems that the major focus or a major purpose of revising the interpretation of the Constitution to allow the exercise of the right of collective self-defense is to strengthen the U.S.-Japan alliance. And reading your report, um, it seemed, um, in, in effect, to create a virtual joint and combined relationship, like we've had with NATO, like we've had with Korea, um, like in some respects we've had with Australia, though we don't have a formal joint and combined command structure. Um, and uh, for most of the post-war period, um, the Japanese side, at least the Diet, has done everything it could to prevent that, to put in place obstacles to being makikomaru, you know, entrapped in the Americans' uh, strategy, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China. So this seems like a complete role reversal. Is the American and U.S.-Japan alliance dimension of this really the heart of it, or is that just an easier way to sell it uh, in the diet, if I could ask a rather cynical question? Before responding to your question, uh, let me say that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the reinterpretation of the collective right of self-defense is not only target of our discussion in the panel. We had uh, three targets. One is, uh, 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 as, as a whole, uh, our mission was uh, to find out the weak points of Japan's uh, legal basis on, uh, of, for national security, and then uh, uh, how to improve, uh, to make advices, uh, how to improve them. And then the, that we have the, then the three targets. One is uh, uh, 
constitution, constitutionally, uh, individual correct exercise of individual right to self-defense is okay, but there are some uh, 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 the weak legal basis uh, where we have to uh, make uh, an another uh, division of the law, self-defense both law, something like that. Uh, one example is that uh, if Japan is attacked, if, uh, if there's an armed attack on Japan, then uh, the prime minister can order self-defense forces to go to fight. But actually, the only in the case of uh, uh, armed attack, which means a planned and organized attack from uh, one country. Uh, therefore, uh, the attack or invasion or uh, anything beyond this, uh, below this, uh, we self-defense forces uh, do not have, uh, not provided any legal basis. So our recommendation is one of the important uh, recommendations is that how to make up for this loopholes. And secondly, uh, of course, the, uh, the collective right of self-defense is our target, and I will speak about this later. And third target is uh, collective security. You know, uh, the Japan has been participating in peacekeeping operations since 1992, but still uh, the activities is very much confined. Uh, the uh, Japan self-defense forces are not allowed to go to help uh, the uh, military of other countries or to, to go to help the civilians. Uh, they are only allowed to fight when they are attacked. Uh, this is very strange. And in order to make uh, uh, self-defense forces to be able to work more flexibly and effectively, we have to change this system. This was the second target. The third target is collective rights of self-defense. Uh, when uh, Japan is attacked, the U.S. has come to help us. But if the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, is attacked out of Japan's territory, then that's a problem. And then uh, whenever uh, there's a crisis uh, in case of emergency, then uh, we should be united together and then be even beyond our border. Uh, that's a basic uh, uh, target of uh, our reinterpretation of collective rights of self-defense. At the same time, also, uh, for example, uh, the we uh, our aim is that uh, to make uh, Japan possible to uh, exercise the collective right of self-defense, which I mean that uh, the uh, if uh, there is a case uh, by which Japan is threatened uh, very much, then uh, Japan can exercise our, our collective right of self-defense. For example, the case of if the Persian Gulf of uh, uh, there was a, there were some mines. In the, in the in the area of in our sea lane, then Japan, this is very dangerous to our uh, security. So uh, it, it's uh, important to remove, to go, to uh, uh, to uh, remove those mines. Uh, it is, uh, but if this is in the in the period of uh, during the fighting, then this is uh, to benefit one side or another. Therefore, uh, it is considered to be a uh, uh, joining in the fighting. Therefore. Uh, uh, we should make it possible for Japan to uh, be able to remove those mines. So, uh, uh, it, but mainly uh, if we are able to uh, uh, work together with the United States in patrolling the Indian Ocean, for example, that will have a very strong uh, deterrent uh, effect over there. So these are the main targets. Uh, but but the, the core is, of course, uh, how to make our relationship deeper and closer in the vicinity of Japan. Um, it makes sense whether you call it virtual jointness, actual joint and combined, uh, whatever you call it, the less doubt there is about the ability of the U.S. and Japan um, to operate together in contingency. The, the less doubt there is about that, the more deterrence there is, the more dissuasion there is, the more of a stabilizing factor there is, uh, is in Asia. Can you say something uh, to us about the process? So the newspapers are reporting yesterday and today that uh, the Liberal Democratic Party, LDP's coalition partner, Komeito, which has sensitivities to these issues in its political base, uh, that the LDP and the Komeito have sort of started to reach a common ground, um, which makes it sound like a, a cabinet uh, decision is possible uh, as planned by the government this month. But then there's legislation, there are other things. Can you talk through for us how you see the politics and the process unfolding? The goal which we are envisioning were the uh, enactment of uh, new laws or revision of the self-defense force law or peacekeeping operation law uh, and other other laws. And but in, before, uh, in order to revise the law, 
uh, the cabinet has to present the bill to the parliament. And in order for the cabinet to present the law, there has to be a separate cab cabinet decisions. And the, in order to make the cabinet decision, you have to, ABT has to persuade the Komeito. That's the reason why they are now focusing on the, uh, how to persuade the Komeito. But even with a cabinet decision, it's not in effect, right? There has to be a legislative process or some other things have to happen. Um, I've heard there are over a dozen bills that would have to be amended. But in the past, people have talked about a sort of one big comprehensive National Security Act. Or how do you see the legislative process? Well, um, uh, the, uh, there are some people, and actually uh, I myself thought uh, about the, the wisdom of the uh, implement uh, the establishment of, of a comprehensive uh, security law. But it takes time. And now uh, the situation does not allow us uh, to give us too much time. Therefore, uh, uh, e even if we can establish a, a comprehensive law, still uh, each bill will require a lot of discussion and a lot of time. Uh, therefore, uh, I, uh, now I think that uh, we should go uh, into the individual lawmaking. And then uh, the, if the uh, uh, LDP could persuade the Kome party, then uh, uh, they can uh, have a, a comfortable majority in both houses. And also there are some other opposition parties like the Ishin Party and the Minnano Party and others uh, to support uh, these bills. So therefore, the, the, this is the key, uh, how to persuade the Kome Party. So on the politics, it, 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 there's all very strong support in the LDP. There's, there's a pretty strong support among Ishin and some smaller conservative parties. And I guess the Democratic Party of Japan's sort of split. And then socialist democratic, so social democrats and communist party are both small but opposed. But the public opinion is very hard to understand from here. Um, some polls show uh, when the public's asked, do you support revised, changing the interpretation of the uh, Constitution, it's sort of 50-50, some of them a little more in favor, some of them a little more opposed. But then others, um, uh, other polls ask, do you support um, joint operations with the United States to uh, keep the Straits of Hormuz open, and there's a very large majority that says yes. Um, so it's, the public opinion is really quite hard to read. What's your sense of the public's view of, of all this? Yeah, certainly, uh, this is very, uh, first of all, this, essentially this is very difficult and uh, very abstract in nature. Uh, it's uh, quite understandable that people cannot understand this very well. Uh, therefore, if we ask a question uh, whether or not you support the change of interpretation of the Constitution or whether you support the, uh, uh, the reinterpretation of the collective right of self-defense, then uh, the uh, answer, the majority is, uh, tends to say no or negative. But actually, when we ask them if we should uh, go to help uh, U.S. vessels out of Japan if they are attacked uh, uh, illegally, then the uh, majority of the people say yes. Therefore, uh, if we, the, the negotiation between LDP and Komeito goes on, and then th if they can present us some uh, bill uh, to the people and to the parliament, then uh, uh, the uh, opposition will decline, I think. There, I'm sure you've seen commentary here and, and in Japan and elsewhere about how important it is to do this in a way that uh, wins understanding in the region. Um, I think, uh, that uh, the Shangri-La uh, meeting a week ago where Prime Minister Abe spoke suggests that for the most part the region is either fine with this uh, development or desires it in order to maintain a, a healthy U.S.-Japan alliance and a stable um, uh, Asia. <coughs> um, uh, China's opposed for sure. Um, and Korea's complicated. Um, there are uh, obvious and clear concerns. On the other hand, an effective U.S.-Japan alliance is important to Korean security, as many experts in, in Seoul know. So it, it puts a heavy burden on the government in Tokyo to do this uh, process, but overall diplomacy with particular care. Um, what do you recommend? What, what do you think is the best way to make sure that um, uh, there's a, a, a robust and positive, or at least not robustly negative, reaction uh, in the neighborhood? Uh, my God, you said uh, that some of the East Southeast Asian countries are uh, supporting our, our efforts strongly, and the other uh, countries in Southeast Asia are quietly supportive, and then uh, China is opposing. But 
if you look at the negotiation between the Japanese position and the Chinese leaders, uh, uh, it, it was pointed out from the Chinese side that uh, there are two conditions for the two leaders to meet together. One is uh, for the prime minister not to go to Yaskini. The other was uh, to recognize the Yask Senkaku issue as a territorial issue. Uh, the no uh, hint, uh, no point was made on this uh, uh, issue, security issue. Therefore, uh, this is uh, not as important as other two, two uh, from even from Chinese viewpoint. And also the, uh, to the uh, Korean people, I think we we, if we can uh, pursue, try to pursue them uh, quietly and patiently, I think uh, at least uh, half of them or a majority of them can be persuaded. Because you know, the, uh, the when it comes to the specialists, uh, many of them are, are, are in agreement with us. Because you know, they are, many of the Korean people believe that they can be uh, assisted by the US military in case of emergency. But the assistance uh, by US assistance to Korea uh, is uh, for the important part of it is uh, through uh, the bases in Japan. So without the cooperation from Japan, it is important for the United States uh, to give uh, effective assistance to, to Korea in case of emergency. And also, we have made it very clear that uh, unless we are invited, we will not join to go to any, any country. Now if uh, South Korea asked us to, to come to help them, uh, we may consider. We may say yes, we, we may say no. And even if, uh, uh, for example, if there is a case in which uh, uh, some American vessel is in danger uh, along the coast of uh, Korean Peninsula, and if we are asked to go and we, we, are, we decided to go, still we may get uh, permission or consent from Korean government uh, if we are uh, going to go across the, their territorial water. So in any case, without their consent or without their, their invitation, we will never go to uh, uh, Korean territory or uh, territorial sea or land at all. Therefore, uh, there's no reason for them to be concerned about this. So uh, I, I think we can, uh, the, uh, uh, we can pursue them. But other effective way might be, as uh, you may have in your mind, we may have uh, a more flexible approach uh, to on, on history and other issues. That may be uh, helpful. When Groucho Marx had his TV show, every once in a while he would have the sign drop down from the ceiling that said, context. <laughs> um, so that context does matter. Um, I'd like to open it up now. If folks could raise your hand, um, and we'll bring a microphone to you and briefly identify yourself and, and ask a question. Uh, and uh, the floor is open. It's a pretty expert audience as I look around. <clears throat> That's unusually shy. Andrew, right? I think we have microphones, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Andrew Oros from Washington College and the East-West Center. Uh, so far, the discussion's been fairly technical. I said there's an expert audience, so I also want to ask a fairly technical question. Uh, on the issue of collective self-defense, the, um, the Cabinet Legislative Bureau, the Hosei Kyoku, has, has stated before that it was not it was not permissible under the constitution and i'm just a little bit unclear about how how that works vis-a-vis -a, -vis a cabinet statement so if if the abe cabinet makes a statement that allows for collective self-defense that overrides the the hosei kyoku's view or will the hosei kyoku previously issue some statement that says they've reconsidered could you talk about the politics of that a little bit you already hosei kyoku is the cabinet legal bureau that renders these Judgment, sort of like the Office of Legal Counsel in the White House. So by the way, we don't just have to have technical questions. Um, Kitaoka Sensei is an expert on many things and uh, Japanese foreign policy broadly. Well, the, uh, in my perspective, I think this is a conflict between the uh, bureaucrat-led politics or politics leading bureaucracy. You know, uh, uh, Cabinet Legislation Bureau is, uh, in a sense, a uh, uh, lawyer for the prime minister. So he has to work for him. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, the, uh, they insist on the uh, autonomy or independence of uh, bureaucrats. That's very strange. So the Asahi Shimbun and other liberal papers are criticizing the uh, Abe's appointment of uh, Mr. Komatsu, Ambassador Komatsu, which is a rather irregular appointment. 
because usually the chief of the cabinet legislation bureau is to be promoted from the deputy. But he changed that. Uh, there's no law uh, about this one, but uh, he, he just wanted to pick up uh, other legal experts who are the authority in uh, international law, and uh, which was criticized by uh, the media. And also, this was similar to the appointment of uh, Mr. Kuroda to the governor of uh, the Bank of Japan. Uh, the, it was criticized as an irregular kind of uh, appointment. What's wrong about that? Uh, why the prime minister is not allowed to pick up uh, a man who he likes and who he respects? And then, uh, the, uh, the also, the, uh, let me add also, the Cabinet Legislation Bureau uh, uh, recognizes that there has been the changes of interpretation of the Constitution only once in the past, but there are many in the past. The, the biggest change of interpretation was, uh, took place in 1954, in which uh, the, the Cabinet uh, recognized that the, uh, despite of the uh, uh, Article 9, second half, uh, Japan is allowed to have uh, uh, the minimum necessary uh, defense power and use it, and then which is a big jump from zero to a minimum necessity, which is a big jump. And then, uh, but the, it was again changed in 1972. The minimum necessity means only the exercise of individual right of self-defense, excluding collective right of self-defense. This was another change. And uh, this is, uh, na now we are trying to change to go back to the 1954 and to make it clear that minimum necessity includes both individual and collective right of self-defense, which is uh, perfectly within the Constitution. In the front here. Hello. I'm Dr. Donna Wells. I'm an expert in the Russian language internet. Can you talk about the benefits to American interests regarding a closer U.S.-Japan security alliance? The, uh, now uh, the, the support for the uh, uh, US-Japan alliance is uh, higher than ever, very strong. And then, uh, but there's a, a tendency among Japanese people to uh, rely on the United States. Uh, uh, there's some concern uh, after the uh, US uh, withdrawal from the East and the US uh, doing nothing in uh, into Ukraine. But still the uh, Japanese people uh, rely on the United States and uh, they, they have a confidence in the uh, US-Japan alliance very much. But the, what you s sometimes hear is the criticism uh, of um, defense guidelines review and of President Obama's robust statement of support for the alliance in Tokyo in April is that this is just encouraging free riding in Japan. So it's great that the Japanese people rely on us so much, but we're tired we're not as rich as we used to be, and, uh, and uh, that's also been a theme for Americans since, I don't know when, <laughs> since we've had alliances. How do we get, so is, is this, my own view is no, but could you explain whether this development represents free riding? What's, to get back to the original question, what's in it for us? I, I know the answer for my part, but I'd like to, <laughs> but nobody here will agree with me, so. <laughs> free, free, free ride is, uh, the, you know, uh, uh, exaggeration, but uh, uh, as you know, since 1951 or not, not since 1960, it was the exchange of a base and then uh, the service. And then uh, we are not uh, expected to help in the United States out of Japan, but uh, instead we are providing the basis. But uh, this balance should be changed uh, because of the change of the uh, uh, our national powers. Uh, the, the relationship between Japan and the United States is uh, very different in 1951 compared to today. So Japan should shoulder more of the uh, responsibility, uh, no, not only vis-a-vis -vis the United States, but also to, to, the, uh, to the world. That is uh, uh, one of the elements of the, uh, the uh, so-called uh, uh, more proactive contribution to peace, which was the essence of the uh, national security strategy, which we adopted last December. You know, uh, Japanese people tend to think that uh, peace can be uh, available or uh, don't touch with uh, any weapons or don't do anything out of Japan. That is the uh, uh, shortest way to peace, which is completely wrong. You know, peace can be achieved by many things. Uh, uh, peace cannot be achieved only by staying at home. And Japan as a big power should do more uh, beyond the border, and then uh, that's uh, the more contribution, uh, more cooperation with the United States is uh, essential, and also part of the our bigger responsibility. 
in the back here. Kitaoka Sensei, thank you. I'm Alexander Sullivan from CNAS. Um, in the press reporting of the past week or so, it appears that a, uh, a deal was made between the LDP and Comedo, um, swapping on the one hand uh, the inclusion of um, the possibility of the SDF operating in contested or combat zones for a deal on um, sort of adjustments to the coordination in gray zone scenarios between the National Command Authority and constabulary forces and the MSDF. Um, so, you know, Comedo gave ground on the latter um, in exchange for holding firm on, on no combat zones on the former. Can you speak to both of those um, from your perspective, having having gotten, you know, uh, having led the discussion on these issues and, and what that might result in uh, in the future? You know, Comedo's idea is that uh, we can do many things uh, by extending our individual right of self-defense. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, we think uh, the panel's opinion is that it's a very dangerous idea to extend, to expand the, the zone of the collective right of self-defense. Uh, uh, for example, uh, one, one case is that if a missile was shoot, shot from uh, North Korea to Guam or Hawaii, and uh, if Japan is able to shoot them down, uh, technically, then will Japan be able to do that? Uh, uh, yes, I think we should do that. Uh, but the Comet and other people believe that it can be done by extending our police right. Uh, but that means uh, uh, the kind of declaration that the space is our territory. It's a very dangerous uh, expansion of the uh, <laughs> right. And then uh, if we do that, then uh, there are some neighbors which we will follow. <laughs> the same kind of thing uh, with pleasure. It, you know, various uh, press uh, commentary or expert commentary said, this is all about missile defense, mm -hmm. or this is all about gray zone, mm -hmm. you know, Senkaku, you know, sort of US-Japan coordination, or this is all about anti-submarine warfare, or it's all about it's the Gulf of Hormuz. I, is it all about one thing, or do you see it more comprehensively? Um, uh, what concerns me a little bit is if we decide it's all about one thing, that defeats the purpose of strengthening the alliance. The alliance should be ready for many things, um, not just sort of building a barrier so that we're just getting ready for one problem. Yes, indeed. You, you know, whenever we show the examples, we, we reiterated that uh, these are just examples. This is not to exclude other cases, because the ambiguity is the essence of uh, national security. You know, if we define, uh, draw the very clear line, the enemy can come to this point, then the ambiguity is uh, uh, a must uh, we, we have to prepare. Uh, therefore, uh, we cannot show the clear line. This is essential, uh, essence of the national security, I think. Rust, is that Rusty? Thank you, Russ Deming at SAIS. Nice to see you, Professor Kadoka. Thank you very much for coming. Um, my question involves, you've been very involved in trying to improve both Japan-China and Japan-ROK relations, particularly on Japan-ROK relations, which are very important to the U.S.-Japan alliance. Um, what, are, what, are the, what could be done, what are the next steps in trying to improve the atmosphere of Japan-ROK relations so that does not become an obstacle to further U.S.-Japan cooperation? Mainly on China. Well, uh, the, uh, I have been uh, sometimes uh, uh, called as an uh, advisor of a brain trust of, uh, for Mr. Abe, which is not the case. I, I'm uh, uh, just asked to work on this issue. So I'm not supporting all of uh, Prime Minister Abe's policy. Uh, on uh, uh, some of the his history issues, I have some disagreements. Uh, beforehand, I have some disagreements on uh, this policy also. Uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, as I said, uh, we had uh, three targets, uh, the, uh, the uh, individual right of self-defense and the uh, uh, collective right of self-defense and also the collective security. And then uh, particularly our focus, one of our focus was uh, the how to improve the, our participation in peacekeeping operations. We have uh, dispatched self-defense forces in South Sudan. Uh, the situation is very uh, fragile over there. And then uh, uh, we have to make them work uh, more effectively. 
but uh, the, the discussion about peacekeeping operation is uh, somewhat postponed by Prime Minister Abe. So I, I'm not, not very uh, happy with that. Also, the on, on history issue, I, uh, uh, though I know that there's a criticism uh, against Mr. Abe as a nationalist or hawkish or right wing or whatever. Uh, uh, to some extent, uh, that uh, uh, kind of criticisms, criticisms might not be wrong. Uh, uh, and then uh, in order to wipe out this kind of criticism, uh, the, uh, he should uh, uh, take up some other uh, policy measures. I hope that um, you know, there should be some change on his uh, policy on Yasukuni, for example. Then I myself uh, is not a supporter of uh, Prime Minister's visit to uh, Yasukuni Shrine. Uh, uh, in, in Yasukuni Shrine, there are uh, many of them are the, uh, the soldiers who fought for the nation and uh, who had to uh, fall on the ground during the fighting uh, since uh, uh, Meiji Restoration or even before that. But there are some uh, people who are included in it uh, who whose uh, 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 decisions, whose wrong decisions led Japan into the wrong and desperate war. Because of that, those decisions, many soldiers had to die unnecessarily. Therefore, there are kind of uh, victims and victimizers are enshrined together. I'm not very happy with this. So I, I hope uh, this should be changed by a, one of those two ways. One is to remove the uh, so-called class uh, criminals and others from Yasukuni Shrine, or to establish a new uh, 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 memorial, uh, which was once discussed under Koizumi administration. I, I hope uh, uh, the new uh, council to discuss the issue should be established in the near future. And then uh, also, uh, I, I, I was once uh, a leader of a Japanese team in Japan-China Joint Study of History with uh, uh, China. And also, I was a member of the uh, Japan-Korea Joint Study of History. I think uh, 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 this kind of activity should be restarted, uh, uh, possibly with the participation of uh, uh, third country scholars. Good suggestions. Uh, Steve Winters, uh, you commented on the uh, claim of autonomy that had traditionally been associated with the cabinet uh, legislative uh, bureau, and you also noted the appointment of Komatsu to uh, be the head uh, outside of the traditional uh, way of doing that. And uh, the question is this, uh, I have read in Jap Japanese sources that the position of autonomy of this cabinet bureau arose because of, of, for one reason, the hesitancy of the Supreme Court in Japan to rule on the interpretation of the Constitution in regard to self-defense forces. So with the apparent weakening of the autonomy of the cabinet bureau in this regard, do you expect that the Supreme Court might be more inclined to issue opinions in these matters, and certainly we expect, or so I read from Japanese sources, cases to be brought before the Supreme Court by the parties that disagree with the Abe policy, perhaps Social Democrats. My opinion is that we should go back to the basic of the Constitution, okay? The, the uh, cabinet or the lawmakers should present their views to the parliament, and the parliament uh, makes a decision on this, and then if this is considered to be unconstitutional, then the, there should be an appeal to the uh, court, and then the final decision should be made by the Supreme Court. And then uh, this is an effective and, and orthodox way of uh, decision making. And then now uh, uh, the, the practice of uh, Japan's constitution and uh, politics is uh, a little bit uh, uh, different from the original uh, the, uh, the, the constitution. I'll get Larry in one sec, but in your view, um, uh, the, the Prime Minister Abe is doing a lot. Um, and you, um, in your paper, by the way, I hope everyone picked up a copy of uh, an outline that Professor Kitoka did of the overall developments in Japan's uh, 
defense and national security policy. But it's a, it's a pretty big to-do list. Um, and uh, of course, that doesn't include the third arrow on the economy, nuclear power, taxes, and a whole host of other big homework assignments. Um, do you think that this security agenda you've outlined is, is Abe's security agenda, or do you think this is likely to be the security agenda of his successor, whoever that may be, whenever that may be? It could be, you know, Eastern Sakiyoyami, one step ahead is darkness and politics. Could be three years, could be six years. But do you think that this, as we say, has legs? Do you think this has enough bipartisan support and momentum that it doesn't hang on Prime Minister Abe's political uh, position alone? Well, one thing I, I just uh, uh, forgot to tell uh, when I, I just uh, read through the, uh, the change of policy. One thing was the, the, uh, uh, the transfer of def defense equipment was uh, uh, a little bit changed recently. Up until then, we had, uh, uh, the, in 1967, many of the Sato cabinet established the three principles on arms export which was tightened by Mickey cabinet in 1976 and blah, blah, blah. The uh, export of weapons uh, was uh, substantially ex uh, prohibited in Japan, but which was relaxed uh, to allow the export of uh, weapons uh, which can be used for the defense uh, of the country which, is, uh, which are threatened by other countries. Uh, in other words, uh, the uh, Export of the uh, the the weapons for a peaceful uh, peaceful purpose should be allowed. This was started by uh, Noda uh, Kang administration and Noda uh, Noda administration under DPJ government, and also uh, there was uh, the the, the uh, national uh, uh, the defense guideline. The 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 one we adopted last year was national guideline for 2014 and beyond. But beforehand, there was a national defense guideline for uh, uh, 2011 and beyond, which was adopted in 2010, in which there was a remarkable shift from the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the focus was until then in, the, in Hokkaido. Still, the major forces were uh, deployed against Russia, which was ridiculous, even to, uh, to the point of 2010, which was finally uh, made uh, a shift to southwest. And then uh, the major shift was done in under DPJ government. And then uh, the, the LG, ADP just uh, accepted and continued that one, but they didn't like uh, uh, to follow the, the same line. So they, say, they are saying that uh, we, we have adopted a completely new one, but actually they are the same. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, for example, in uh, the I was involved in both changes. And they, in the end of uh, 2010, uh, there was a, a reduction of the 1,000 soldiers in the ground forces. Uh, but uh, because the LDP didn't like it, so they, uh, whenever, as soon as they came to the power, they just increased the number. And then, uh, uh, is it really necessary in today's situation? That's a big question, anyhow. And in uh, uh, last year, there was an increase of uh, 5,000 soldiers in ground forces decided, which is, uh, uh, though, though it was decided in, in, the, in the panel uh, where I was the chair, <laughs> still, uh, despite of my opposition, it was adopted. Uh, therefore, uh, there is a strong uh, bureaucratic autonomy still going on. So the changes are very incremental. Still, the basic line is, uh, uh, has a support from uh, both parties, I guess. General Yamaguchi can explain the military logic of that in a minute. Um, continuity and bipartisanship, in other words. It, 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 uh, perhaps the direction doesn't hinge on Prime Minister Abe, but the political capital he has explains why things are, are moving forward. Um, Larry? Larry Nick from CSIS. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kitaoka, do the proponents of Japan adopting a collective self-defense, do they believe that the self-defense forces, in order to carry out the objectives that you have laid out, the three objectives, that the, do they believe that the self-defense forces will require in the future 
different kinds of weapon systems, uh, different kinds of equipment uh, in order to enhance capabilities? Or do they believe that basically what Japan has now, what the self-defense forces have now, will be adequate uh, to carry out these uh, new missions if Japan does adopt collective self-defense? I, I think that uh, Japan can expand their activities with uh, today's uh, weapons, which we, we still have, we already have. Rather, if uh, Japan decline uh, to expand our activities beyond the border, and still if Japan wanted to uh, defend ourselves by individual right of self-defense only, then the logical conclusion might be we should have a uh, Bigger weapons. Is that as specific as you want to get? <laughs> is this, you, that is as specific as you want to get. Some, something big. Something bigger. Um, well, the next panel can <laughs> dive into that one in, in specifics. You know, uh, we're talking a lot today about military capabilities, military uh, defense industrial cooperation and military strategy, but in Japan's inventory of national power, the military is just one, and, and with all respect to the uniform people in the front row, not even necessarily the most important part of Japan's national power. How would you rank the, um, you mentioned at the very beginning that Prime Minister Abe did Japan's first national security strategy. How would, what grade would you give it overall? Not, not, not these specific defense related areas, but ODA, soft power, um, public diplomacy uh, and so forth. Um, I've worked on two national security strategies uh, at the White House. I would never ask someone what grade they would give them because these are always committee efforts and public and political efforts, but, uh, but it gives you a good sense of strategic direction. So how would you grade the national security strategy as an overall comprehensive uh, 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 strategy? No, especially, especially including foreign policy ODA and you know the, the, not just the military aspects we've been talking about. Yeah, considering the uh, today's economic situation, uh, I, I think I would give uh, A to other security policy. I want to I want to take your class at uh, Kokusai Um d Do you think it gave sufficient attention to development assistance, trade, and other aspects? Well, it, it's very important. Uh, let me uh, touch on uh, the issue I just forgot to mention. Uh, the, when uh, the concept of uh, uh, proactive, uh, more proactive contribution piece was adopted, was discussed in the panel uh, in which I was a chair, I thought uh, uh, this is a good case in which we can show that the Mr. Abe is not trying to deny the Japan's foreign policy after the war. Uh, this is a continuation of Japan's foreign policy after the war. Japan started its official development aid in the 1950s, even before becoming a member of OECD, and then Japan started the uh, participation in peacekeeping operation in 1992, and then uh, Japan started to promote the concept of human security at the United Nations to help the poorest countries in the world. So the, based on this uh, achievement, uh, Japan is trying to go ahead more, and then that is the evidence that uh, Mr. Abe is not uh, thinking of uh, uh, bringing Japan back to uh, a full year period. And then uh, as a whole, uh, but as, as I said, considering today's uh, financial uh, situation, I would give A. So uh, we wish we could uh, uh, spend more on uh, ODA. And then uh, the, uh, the rise of our military budget is only 2.8%, uh, excluding the personnel, uh, then it's only uh, less than 1%. So this is very modest. Therefore, uh, I'd like to stress that uh, the Abe's uh, focus is not on uh, hard power. The focus is the soft power. The essence of uh, soft power is a uh, rule of law. Then, then that's why we, are, we cannot be indifferent in the with the situation in South China Sea. The, uh, the, the peaceful solution of international conflicts the commitment to a uh, peaceful solution of international conflicts is the most important uh, achievement of human beings after two great wars in the 20th century. Therefore, uh, this is something we cannot be indifferent. Therefore, the, uh, how to strengthen this uh, framework? But rule of law should be accompanied by some 
power balance. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, it is also very necessary. That's why I give uh, uh, A in today's financial situation. Because they can't spend much more in the Japanese government right now on aid, and because that document emphasized rule of law uh, quite a bit. I think we have time for one more question. Um, yes, sir, back over there. Uh, my name is Tayo Scanlon Kimura. I'm with SAIS. Kitaoka sensei nashite itadaite. Um, I have heard the, the terminology containment policy regarding China and many scholarly articles and whatnot, and I was talking to a CSIS expert last week after another panel, and he was talking about the need to engage with China. Um, what, what do you think about those specific vocabularies and how can U.S., Japan, collectively and individually continue to engage with China and not give a perceived sense of roping China in? Thank you. Th that's the uh, uh, most difficult question uh, in the world. Uh, actually, uh, containment is, I don't like to use the, this word containment. Containment is the specific word which you used uh, to vis-a-vis -vis Soviet Russia in the Cold War time, uh, in which we had a very limited economic transaction with the Soviet bloc. Uh, while uh, we have a uh, very much uh, interdependent relationship with China. So we cannot contain them, or we should not contain them. Uh, we just want to invite them to be uh, an active and responsible member of the international community. And uh, we know that uh, there are many uh, respectable people in China, uh, and also in order to encourage them, in order not to disappoint them, we should not uh, uh, make any big compromise on this issue. So we should be firm on the issue of uh, uh, rule of law, which is uh, to be uh, achieved also in the domestic area. Uh, in, in China, uh, uh, when, as I said, I was uh, chairman of Japan-China Joint Strategy of History. During that uh, exercise, one of the Chinese scholars was uh, arrested and put into the jail for 20 years. Uh, now uh, uh, it was reduced to 14 years, but still that could happen uh, sometimes in China. Uh, in order uh, to help those people, uh, we should be firm on human rights and democracy. Uh, not aggressively, but patiently, uh, we, we have to uh, be firm on this issue. And then uh, uh, we should wait. Uh, uh, China is a country, uh, uh, they are usually very prudent, uh, cautious in uh, in going into the military exercise. Uh, they, they, they are, uh, their words can be very uh, strong, but uh, in, in reality, they are very cautious in, uh, uh, in, in going into the decision making, I think, I hope. <coughs> that question reminds me of um, a press conference about 20 years ago when uh, uh, the new head of Asia at the Pentagon, who everyone knows, Kurt Campbell, <coughs> was trying to say uh, in the context of our upgrading of the alliance with Japan that we also had to engage China. People didn't use the word engage as much in those days. And so GG Press translated as Tsutsumi Komu, which means basically to embrace, which was then interpreted across Asia as contain. <laughs> so these are, these are tricky, tricky, uh, tricky words, but um, yeah, in, in the Pentagon, if you've been there, you know, in the policy uh, area, they on the walls, they have the words deter, dissuade, uh, reassure, dissuade, deter, defeat, sort of the spectrum of strategy. <coughs> and a lot of what um, is concretely being done right now in the U.S.-Japan alliance is, in my view, a necessary um, step to integrate more and strengthen dissuasion and deterrence <coughs> and reassure Japan and other allies or partners that are worried but probably, it's a good question, and uh, this panel on probably the next stage uh, in strategic uh, thinking together with the U.S. and Japan as allies is that reassurance part. What can we do without undercutting the steps we're taking to sh necessary steps to shore up dissuasion, deterrence, to reassure other parts of Asia and Japan itself? What steps can we take together uh, to try to uh, uh, reassure, <coughs> understanding that uh, for many uh, commentators in Beijing, the word containment is very, very useful uh, to drive an agenda they have, um, and that, uh, you know, we shouldn't perhaps worry too much about the frequent use of the word containment to describe our policy. We did a survey, some of you may have seen, we rolled it out a week ago um, here at CSIS, where we asked 
a large number of experts across Asia about the future of power uh, order norms in the region. And one of the questions we asked is, how would you characterize the U.S. rebalance to Asia? And outside of China, it had overwhelming support. Um, and when, when respondents characterized it, um, in China, over 80 percent said it's designed to contain China or it's too confrontational with China. Nowhere else in the region did that answer get more than 10 percent of the response. The, the main response was, great idea, needs more resources. <laughs> Uh, so we have, I think, a lot of homework to do. Um, uh, Kitaka Sensei, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your work on all these commissions and for enlightening us. <coughs> um, please joining me in showing our appreciation before we turn to the next panel.